I'm graduating. I'm getting my PhD in nutritional sciences. Beautiful day. It's a fun time. Hail. Take two, take two. We are taking pictures at Alma. It's just a really big deal, something that you're going to want to look back on and appreciate that you did. Every year when everybody graduates, they all wait in line to take pictures with Alma, dressed up as we are. Alma Mater was really a labor of love for Laredo Taft. He really put two contradictory things together there. He put something, you know, that has both a lot of strength, but that is also welcoming. His Alma reaches out towards you. She's approachable. That figure is active. When Laredo Taft created the Alma Mater in 1929, he wanted students to interact with it. Almost a century later, they are still fulfilling his wish. First time I saw the Alma Mater statue, I came up to it and I immediately thought, it's a masterpiece. It shows a deeply grounded training, someone with a knowledge of the history of art. He wanted that statue to be there to recognize the love he had for the place that had molded him. All of his formative years were at the University of Illinois. His family was there, his father taught there. In 1871, Laredo Taft's father was hired to teach geology and zoology at the university. His father helped the university plan a grand art gallery, and dozens of plaster casts of classical sculptures were ordered from Europe. However, they arrived in pieces. Young Laredo helped his father repair the sculptures, and it inspired him to study art. He earned his bachelor's and master's degrees at Illinois in 1880. Rado Taft was really born with a natural talent as a sculptor. Sculptors like Laredo Taft went to Paris. In Paris, Taft learned classical sculpture techniques at the École des Beaux-Arts. Students studied the nude human form and were asked to express its ideal in clay models. Lavish ornamentation, as well as symmetry, were characteristics of their work. You can't understand the story of American art if you don't study Taft. Taft left Paris in 1883 and returned home to Illinois. He settled in Chicago. He wanted to stay among his people of the Midwest, helping to create an art scene in Chicago. He saw Chicago as a place where he could step in and really make his way in the world. And he decided, well, if I have to start and build my way up from the ground up, he would do so. He did things like death masks, wrought iron work, decorative reliefs. And as the 25th anniversary of the Civil War came up, a lot of veterans and citizens were putting up funds to build war memorials. Taft was still undiscovered, so he went along for the ride for relatively low wages. One of his greatest, earliest Civil War memorials is in Winchester, Indiana. It is an extremely complex conical. It has reliefs and freestanding figures. He wanted to show off all the skills that he'd learned in Paris. There's a couple things he did that were very important for his initial years in Chicago. Laredo Taft became a teacher at the Art Institute of Chicago. And he gave a lot of public lectures. Through that, he was able to gather a following and to work with a lot of other different artists and poets during the period we call the Chicago Renaissance. Chicago in the 1880s was growing faster than every other city in the United States. It was really the World's Columbian Exhibition that brought about a kind of rebirth of the arts in Chicago. Starting with the Columbian Exposition, Taft started to, to get famous. It was his first big deal in Chicago. It was a moment where Chicago was really making its mark on the world scene. They rebuilt the city with these enormous buildings, with sculpture. The World Fair covered 600 acres. Taft was close friends with Daniel H. Burnham, who was building the fair. Daniel Burnham made Laredo Taft charge of all the sculptural decoration of the architecture. Everything had to be built very quickly. 
the Columbia Exposition was far behind schedule, so he asked Daniel Burnham if he could possibly have women assist him so as to make the deadline, and Daniel Burnham replied, you can use white rabbits if that's what it takes to get the job done. Loretto Taft, who had been teaching at the Art Institute of Chicago and had many very talented female students, decided that he would hire a number of women workers to work for him, and they called them the White Rabbits. The women's press at the time sent reporters out immediately to report on this. The women were ordering men as assistants around and telling them what to do. He was someone who did make opportunities for women at a time where a lot of other people didn't. Women were being encouraged to be in art, but in their right place. If you could do the work, he would hire you. So he hired Italian-Americans, German-Americans, French, African-Americans, and lots of women. Taft's home and studio on Chicago's South Side was a gathering place for artists from across the city. There, Taft connected two barns to create a large workspace that was known as the Midway Studios. He was able to produce dozens of monuments within a fairly short period of time. When the project to do Mount Rushmore came up, Laredo Taft was the first person called. He declined the commission. He was just very big on getting an art community going in Chicago. Chicago has a proud history in public sculpture, and I think Fellowship of the Soul is my favorite Laredo Taft sculpture. It shows two women and two men coming out of the rock, backs to each other, holding hands, but they're very independent. Laredo Taft really wanted to get at some basic ideas about no matter how connected we think we are, in the end, we are separate souls. By that point, Taft realized that he didn't want the kind of detail that was in Beaux-Arts sculpture. And that's true of the blind, a stunning sculpture that stops you. You have this child who is leading this group of blind people and child's eyes see, whereas everyone else is clearly blind. So Taft moved away from more traditional sculpture and he realized the expressive possibilities of abstraction. In 1922, Taft created his most ambitious sculpture to date. The Fountain of Time stretches 126 feet across and includes over 100 figures, including one of the artist. To keep costs down, he explored the use of new materials. The Fountain of Time was the first piece of art to be created from hollow cast concrete reinforced with steel. Laredo Taft did believe that the Fountain of Time was going to be his great legacy. And one end of the fountain starts with these figures rising up out of the earth. The middle section, we have young people falling in love, young men going off to war. And then as you go to the far end of the sculpture, you see older ladies and gentlemen descending into the earth. So you have this kind of Mobius strip of life. And then standing across from it, you have old Father Time who's watching this whole thing. The Fountain of Time really is his way to get people thinking about bigger philosophical issues about life and the passage of time. Can I tell you my favorite Loretto Taft quote? <laughs> One thing which separates us from our brother animals is the fact that we can send messages down through the generations. We can send greetings to a world unborn. The means by which this is done is art.